everybody, and welcome to EHOP's seventh annual Know Your Vote Forum. Um, I'm Nanda Barker Hook, and I'm the president of EHOP, and I welcome everybody here this evening. We're so glad to see you. Um, we have a panel of um, nine or ten uh, town leaders who are going to be answering all of our questions relating to all things town meeting and what we're going to be voting on on May 6th. Um, thank you to everybody who came out to the high school library. Uh, to engage in the conversation and ask your questions at the microphone. And thank you also to people who are tuning in online. We're streaming um, live on Facebook and also on YouTube, on HCAM's YouTube channel. So I would like to start by introducing our panel. Um, if you just want to give a little hello as I say your name. Um, Claire Wright, Chair of the Board of Selectmen. Tom Garabedian, Town Moderator. Norman Kamalo, town, town manager. Um, Elaine Lazarus, director of land use and town operations. Uh, Nancy Kavanaugh, chair of the school committee. Dr. Carol Kavanaugh, superintendent of schools. Susan Rothermich, director of finance and operations of schools. Uh, Muriel Kramer, is Muriel down yet? Yes, Muriel Kramer, chair of the planning board. <laughs> Thank you, Muriel. Uh, Dan Terry, chair of parks and recreation and Mike Rogan, Chair of the Historical Commission. So thank you so much for being here and answering all of our questions. Um, <clears throat> I wanna thank also the town and the schools and HCAM for all of your support in um, holding this forum with us. And we also wanna give a special shout out to our marathon runner, Chris Hart. Um, he ran his very first marathon in Boston a few weeks ago and he completed it and he went above and beyond in fundraising for EHOP. He raised over $6,000 for us, which is incredible. It's gonna have a real impact on our work. So uh, thank you to Chris Hart. Um, so town meeting happens once a year. Um, it's a unique opportunity for all of us to gather in the middle school auditorium and make decisions that really shape the future of Hopkinton. Um, in the coming year and beyond. It's really the pinnacle of all the work that's done throughout the year by the boards and committees. Um, all the public input that's provided in the various hearings that happen throughout the year. All the number crunching that happens behind the scenes too with the town leaders to um, finalize the budget. Um, and so EHOP holds this forum in order to give the town an opportunity to come and ask questions and learn about what we're going to be voting on before we show up so that we can show up informed and ready to engage in the conversation and vote. Um, it's important to us to make this forum accessible to everybody, including people who can't come to the library in the evening. So that's why we stream online. And we invite questions in the room at the microphone, but also um, Please feel free to send in your questions to our email, knowyourvote at ehop.org. Um, you can post on Twitter and Facebook, hashtag hoptm19. And um, you can also comment under the Facebook live stream and the YouTube live. It's a lot of different ways to ask questions. And so we have board members collecting those questions and they're feeding them up to um, Tara, San Sanda, and I here at the front. Um, and we're gonna try to weave them in in between questions in the room. If we can't get to all the questions, we're gonna collect them and post answers after the forum. So to start with some basics, um, town meeting is on Monday, May 6th. Uh, it starts at 7 p.m. in the um, middle school auditorium. And depending on how many articles we're voting on every year and how long the discuss discussion goes, it could last anywhere from two to four evenings. Um, the town election is on Monday, May 20th, and polls are open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. in the middle school Brown Gym. So, I am going to do a very high level overview of some of the articles on the warrant to get us started and then we'll get into the Q&A. Um, this is by no means all the articles, there are many of them. It's hard to sort of pick out what we think might be you know, most interesting or compelling or the things that people are talking about. We do our best. Um, if you wanna read the full warrant, you can go to our website and you can go to the town website for that. Um, also on our website and the town website is the Appropriations Committee Report, which is 
extremely helpful. It, it uh, explains sort of by department little summaries of the various highlights of the um, coming fiscal year and, and their various budget items. Uh, so let's get started. So I'm going to go through this chronologically from, you know, from the beginning of the warrant to the end. Uh, articles 5 through 8 are the BRAVE Act. They are tax exemptions for veterans. Um, I'm not going to get into each detail because it would take up the whole forum, so I'm just going to introduce them and then feel free to come to the mic with your questions. Article 10 is uh, the big one, the fiscal 2020 operating budget. It's just over $90 million. Um, it represents a tax impact of 2.5% on residents and businesses. Um, and that equals $260 tax increase for the average home of just under $600,000. Article 10 also includes a tax underride. Tax underrides are complicated, and uh, I'm not the person to explain them. <laughs> uh, but that's why we have the panel. So what we've learned in you know watching the meetings and reading the documents is tax underrides aren't a tax break. Um, but they are, um, they would establish a lower budget limit for FY 2021 and beyond. And so I'll leave it at that. And if you want to ask questions, we have experts to answer, answer those. Um, the school budget is also part of Article 10. We vote on the town budget and the school budget together. Uh, it's just over $48,500,000. And that represents a, uh, just over a 6.5% increase from FY 2019. Um, it's based on 2018-19 um, enrollment numbers plus 103 new sto students expected by the fall of 2019. Um, just a side note, since the budget was sort of um, created and discussed and finalized over the fall and the winter, um, 37 new students have enrolled, roughly, and 32 have begun electronic K through 12 enrollment. Um, so that leaves 34 spots for new students until the fall of 2019. Article 17 is pay-as-you-go capital expenses. It's a long list of items. Two of them relate to studies in response to town growth. Um, one is a fire station feasibility study for $75,000. That's to study the um, renovation and possible addition of a new fire station. And the second is the school capacity study for $50,000. Um, it's a long-range planning study for the increased student enrollment. Article 23 is a sidewalk master plan phase two. That's just over $1 million. It's for the design and construction of the second phase of the five-year sidewalk plan on West Main Street and Wood Street. Um, Article 24 is the school bus parking lot. It's an item for $300,000 to construct uh, a bus parking lot right behind the high school on Field 9, which is right behind the high school cafeteria. This is an item we actually approved last year. Uh, and approve $400,000 worth of funding for that, and this is sort of coming back and requesting additional funds for the parking lot. Article 25 is purchasing a ladder truck for the fire department for $1.2 million. This is the largest capital item on the warrant, and it requires a second vote um, on the ballot on election day, May 20th. Article 31 are all the community preservation funding items. Um, the last one on the list, H, is the largest one, which is uh, $260,000 for the replacement of all existing equipment at EMC Playground. Article 31D and Article 45 both relate to dogs, so we put them together because it seemed the right thing to do and we wanted to put Titan up on our slides. <laughs> um, 31D is a commun uh, community preservation item, which is $150,000 for design, engineering, and construction of a dog park on Fruit Street. And Article 45 is a new kennel licensing bylaw. Article 46, uh, this would designate 76 Main Street as the Aaron and Lucy Claflin House Historic District. Uh, 
Article 51, municipal parking. Uh, to authorize the town to acquire parcels of land to provide town hall and municipal parking in the downtown area. Negotiations, negotiations are ongoing and the proposed expenditure of funds have not been finalized. Um, I assume they will be by town meeting. So zoning articles are articles 32 through 43. Again, you can go to the town warrant on our website to read them in detail. This is a very high level summary. This does not represent all of them. These are pictures that we pulled off of the internet. They don't necessarily, they didn't come exactly from the applicant or um, from zoning advisory or planning board. It was just a way to summarize them. Um, to, so just to go around, there's a, a zoning article that would allow um, indoor recreation facilities on South Street. Um, there's a, an article that would allow uh, self-storage on South Street. That's a citizen's petition. Um, there's an article that would add year-round screening around solar farms. Um, and an article that would uh, increase the size of um, temporary banners. Um, there's also an article that would restrict residential growth. That's a citizen's petition. Um, an article to move the allowable area where we can have car washes. We don't have any in town right now, but currently you could have one downtown. And if this article is approved, it would move that allowable area would be South Street. Um, and the last image is more complicated. So we'll see if we get into that um, as part of the Q&A. Um, that is a picture of, at Legacy Farms, there's 180 um, age-restricted units. And so there are two zoning articles relating to that. One of them would remove the age restriction, and the other one would change the way affordable housing is handled in that neighborhood. Okay, so um, I'm gonna kick off the Q&A with one question, and then we're gonna go right to questions that we've already been receiving them online, so we can get right into it, and then please feel free at any time to come up to the microphone. Um, a couple of guidelines, we are not as formal as town meeting, you don't have to list your address, um, but we would ask if you're comfortable to say who you are, what your name is. Um, we ask you to keep it sort of to the point and, and brief because we're hoping for a lot of questions. Um, and so with that, I'm going to kick it off with a, with a question for Mr. Garabedian, our town moderator. Um, as the town moderator and the person who presides over town meeting, what do you think is most important for residents to keep in mind when we come to town meeting? Do you have a microphone? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the primary thing that people should understand as they approach town meeting is that, you know, our open town meeting is the purest form of, of democracy uh, that's, that's practiced within the United States. It truly is government by the people because you have an opportunity at town meeting to vote on budgets, to decide, you know, which uh, capital expenditures you want to make uh, to advance your point of view with respect to any of the warrant articles that are that are in front of you and to uh, attempt to convince your uh, fellow citizens of, of your position and, and hope to get them to uh, to agree with you. And in particular in this town meeting, I'm, I'm surprised, Nanda, that you didn't cover one of the most important articles, and that is whether we will continue to elect selectmen in the future or whether we'll simply elect a select board. But I can promise you this year's town meeting will not be anything uh, where you'll be bored at all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, as I said, it was very hard to pick what we were gonna highlight in the beginning and we could go for hours highlighting, so thank you for bringing that one up. Um, does anybody wanna start with questions in the room or should we just go straight to our questions here that are coming in online? Looks like we'll go online. Okay, so we're really gonna let the sort of community drive the conversation and the questions, so it's not always gonna flow like we're talking about zoning now or we're talking about um, you know, bylaw changes. It's gonna, we're gonna go sort of back and forth. Um, okay, so <clears throat> question that came in from Facebook relates to the renovations to EMC Playground. Um, 
are those renovations going to include the skate park? Uh, the renovations are not for the skate park. Um, we would be open to hearing any suggestions in future years, but we have not heard much in lines of suggestions for the skate park. Um, those renovations are strictly to replace the, um, the playground that's, that's there now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, okay, here's one who just came in via email. Uh, Mr. Kalmalo, can you explain in lay terms what an underride is? Um, and let's see if there's other parts where I can include here. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's it. I think if you could explain it in layman, layman terms to all of us, we'd all appreciate it. Thanks. I think it's on. Based on the Massachusetts state law, towns can tax at no more than 2.5% above the previous year. And in the context of Hopkinton, an underride, therefore, is a mechanism that allows the town to lower the tax levy. In other words, if the town has the ability to tax at 2.5% and the underwrite removes permanently 1% of that, thus the underwrite lowers the tax rate to 1.5 percent. Sure, yes, Claire. This is right. Sorry. I just want to add um, just a couple things because the language in the ballot article, um, the ballot talks about the town to be required to reduce the amount of real estate and personal tax to be assessed for FY 2019. Um, I think, Nanda, you clarified that this is not a reduction in your taxes. It kind of sounds that way when you read the way the ballot article is written, but it does not affect your tax rate either way. Um, the excess levy is what remains if the town in a tax year does not use the full 2.5% that we're allowed under Prop 2.5. So it stays there. And every year, if we're conservative in our budgeting and we leave some of that on the table, that builds up. It creates an amount of money that the town could go get and ask for if they wanted it, if they needed it, without having to ask the taxpayers in the form of an override. Um, and when it gets to a certain level, I think there's been a feeling this was put forth by the Board of Selectmen that we shouldn't leave this much money out there that the town, that the selectmen and the budget could simply ask for without the understanding and the acceptance of the taxpayers. So that is the thinking behind reducing your excess tax levy. Um, a couple things to consider in the excess levy is we had a number alter of alternatives as to how much of the levy we decided to remove. As it turns out, there was a motion put forward to wipe the entire slate. Um, we looked at doing 200. It, the amount is $1,180,568. We looked at whether we should take off 250000 500000 a $1 million. The motion put forward was to wipe the entire thing off. There are some considerations for the voters, and there's no right answer. Um, some of the pros for reducing your tax levy are that some uh, bonding agencies could look at that as a sign of fiscal conservatism, um, budget control, fiscal strength. It means that if we need more money, we have to go ask the taxpayers for every red cent over. 
um, with respect to our bond rating, which is now a triple A, if we were to drop down to a double A, that represents about a 7% seven per, 7 discount over a 10-year bond. So maintaining our, our high bond rating has a real dollars and cents effect on what we pay for debt service. As a con, a couple of the cons are that some uh, agencies can look at excess levy as a financial strength. It's a cushion against hard times. They also could look at the fact that even though our stabilization fund is not at the level the Department of Revenue would recommend it to be at, which would be 5% of your overall budget, we're about a half a million dollars short. Having excess levy is a financial buffer that makes up for our lack of fully funding our stabilization fund. And sometimes, um, you know, bonding agencies can, if you have wild swings where you're overriding and underriding and overriding and underriding, that can look at like instability and, and poor budget control. So there are pros and cons on, their, on both sides to be considered. Um, there is no choice as far as the voters as to whether we took less off. The motion was made for the entire levy and that's what's on the ballot. So it will mean that going forward next year, um, we will have to exercise extreme fiscal control, which we have been, but there really is not any, gonna be any slop whatsoever for any uh, unexpected expenses or things where we might wish to call in some of what we very responsibly have not used in previous years. And I'm sorry to go on so long, but I think it's an important question and something that's kind of hard to understand. So I hope you forgive me for going no, a little long here. That's one of the harder ones of the evening, I think. But um, I just want to remind people that you can go on to ehop.org and you can see the town finance office wrote a really clear, helpful paper on underrides that included a list of pros and cons. Background talks about how they're very rare. Um, so it, it gives some good context, and you can read all that on our website. Um, Brian Herr, actually selectman, sent us an email, and he just wanted us to say um, about underrides, uh, meaning taxes that could have been raised inside the legal 2.5% Massachusetts tax law, but were not for several years, will be removed from the tax rolls thereby lowering the tax base permanently. Leaving the excess levy in place leaves open the opportunity for the town to increase taxes above 2.5% without asking the residents for an override. Okay, we have a question in the room. Um, it, it's on the override. Um, I know that uh, Mrs. Wright said that it happens very rarely. This will actually be the third underride in 10 years. Um, does this, next year if we can't and i know you guys are fiscally responsible if we can't make that budget does that mean we have an override next year who would like to take that question my understanding is that this is a hypothetical question <laughs> we can't make budget will we have an override the if question we, was if yes, we can't yes. make budget will we have an override next year if we cannot make budget based on the taxation level that is allowed in town, yes, you are correct. If there's need for additional funds, the town will have to go through an override. Again, this is a hypothetical question. Okay. Um, Here's an email that came in regarding um, HCAM, actually. So it says, HCAM currently gets funding directly, quarterly, from the cable companies. Article 12 sets up an enterprise fund for that money, and the town would vote at next year's town meeting to distribute the money that comes in this year to HCAM. What does HCAM use for funding for the next year? Or am I misunderstanding how the enterprise fund would work? Other towns have two articles, one to create the enterprise fund and the second to fund it for the coming year. I think, is that for you, Mr. Kamalo? Yes. 
I think you're going to be busy tonight. <laughs> the, the question correctly points out that uh, in this cycle, we are not requesting an appropriation for HCAM. My understanding is that HCAM may have the funds necessary for its operation in the coming year. Okay. Um, here is a question for, I'm just making sure we're covering some of these. Um, okay. This one relates to the ladder truck, um, which could be for Mr. Kamalo, or I know we have Chief Slayman in the room as well. Um, can you clarify, if we bought a truck in 2016, what was the cost in 2016, and are we able to sell it before, and could that be contingent before a $1.2 million purchase? That came to us through Facebook. So the fire chief is coming up to the mic. Good evening. Good Thanks evening. for uh, inviting me. Um, so in 2016, we did purchase a used ladder truck. It was um, it was $125,000 total cost. We purchased it for $115,000, and we invested another 10 into some uh, standardized equipment that's on the like a radio and some of the features that needed to meet Hopkinton's uh, operations. Um, we've been researching what the uh, possible trade-in value would be, and on, it's not a great market for a piece of equipment like that that's uh, 20 years old, so that's why we got it at the price we did. It's actually a, a nice ladder truck, um, but it is 20 years old, and it comes with some unique pieces to it that challenge us a little bit, and that's a part of our decision to purchase a new one. Um, I expect that we would get uh, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, sixty-five to eighty thousand dollars. I think that's just a, a broad number to anticipate, and we did calculate that in as a part of what we would need to um, bring the new uh, piece of equipment operational. So, I'm hoping that answers the question. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, come to the mic. If anybody who wants to ask a question at the mic, please just come on up to the mic. We're on a roll. <laughs> I'm Matt. First, I wanted to start by acknowledging and thanking all of you. I think you had a really monumental task ahead of you, or ahead of you, behind you, looking back at it, in the previous year. I really want to acknowledge, I personally challenged some of you at town meeting about budget control, no, meeting the needs of the town without coming to us as an open checkbook. And, mm -hmm. I really respect that you seem to have done that and you've labored to do so. So as someone who challenged aggressively when he didn't like what he saw, I'm more than comfortable coming up and acknowledging I may have been wrong. So thank you very much for honoring what were one constituent's legitimate concerns. So recognizing those challenges and having just validated you, I'm gonna use the compliment sandwich now. This is a trick we do. Can you help me understand as someone who lives near legacy farms and recognizing those challenges, why would we potentially be removing an age restriction on the housing that has more potential to bring children and younger families into town to burden those services that we're so concerned about looking into the next fiscal year? I think that's a question for Muriel Kramer, the chair of the planning board. So Matt, I'd like to thank you for starting me off easy <clears throat> with the, the easy question. Um, so this is a really, really complicated question, and, um, and I understand uh, how people are wondering about it. So we are contemplating, we have an article on town meeting, to remove the age restriction insofar as we would remove the restriction on the under 18. <clears throat> the reason that we have to contemplate a change, and this is one methodology, is because that developer as part of the permit as part of the as part of the zoning that we passed at town meeting previously um, is mandated to include affordable housing and in order to get the state to approve affordable housing in that development there cannot be a restriction on children so one piece one 
approach would be to remove the age restriction on the, the under 18. It would still be an over 55 development. <clears throat> and recognizing that that would mean 18 units um, of affordable housing, which we are preserving, and that is a priority. Um, it would mean the potential for school children in 180 units, which is a challenging concept. However, under the umbrella of the uh, OSMUD, there is financial remuneration for children over a certain number. So there is a balancing force financially to, um, to account for that as an option. If um, the other option on town meeting would <clears throat> maintain the age restriction within the development would require the developer to either pay the town um, a sum of money in lieu of affordable housing to our affordable housing task fund. And if that money was ever used, and hopefully it will be someday to build affordable housing, we can presume that there would be children um, in, in that housing. So that is a contemplation. Um, and also, we um, could require the developer to build uh, affordable housing outside of, of Legacy Farms to, to mitigate for the loss of the affordable housing within Legacy Farms. Um, that also sets up an, a further complication that um, the number of units is 180, 18 are mandated. If 18 come out, then they're only building, the numbers all change. Um, so there are two options. The planning board is wrestling real time with this question to try and come up with um, a recommendation for one approach or the other. We have another meeting on Thursday night with um, the developer to try and just talk this this through. Um, but the, the bottom line, the top bottom line is, in order to count the affordable units for the state within that development there cannot be any restriction on children. So we have to solve it another way. One follow-up. OSMUD, can you please explain what that is and how it relates? What does the acronym stand for? Just because it, it's thrown around a lot and it's not entirely gonna, clear. I'm not going to get it right the first time. The uh, Open Space Mixed Use Development Overlay District. So that's Legacy Farms. Yes. OK. Just to be clear, great, thank you. Um, okay, here's a question that came in via email. Uh, what's better for rapid town growth in the next few years requiring big spending? Override or underride? Again, what's better for rapid town growth in the next few years requiring big spending, override or underride? Or is there no re relation? How, I'll try and rephrase the question. How can an override be better for the town if the town is growing? Is that the question? What do you think? <laughs> I think this person it, it, yeah. is taking what's happening in Hopkinton right now and trying to figure out what is better for the residents of Hopkinton, that we have this underride where we're controlling our spending, or we don't have it where there's money out there that can be used at any time. So it's the condition it, of Hopkinton yes. today. I think it's also helpful to understand that the decision to move forward or to put forward the question on an underwrite was undertaken within the context of a carefully developed and finalized budget process. So if we are going to take FY20 as an example, the underwrite that is being proposed <coughs> is consistent with the budget that is being moved forward. So it's not putting, as far as FY20 is concerned, the underwrite does not put Hawkington at risk. With regard to the override, again, I'll use FY20 to illustrate the point. There is no need for an override in FY20. 
I think Ms. Wright has a response. Um, Follow up. I, I guess I just want to add that when this question came up, I personally was in favor of an underride that did not take every single <laughs> cent off the table but left something there with the understanding that especially in a rapidly growing town, there could be a situation, and we've worked very, very <coughs> hard this year to keep that budget at 2.5. In fact, only a couple weeks earlier it was at 2.9. But there could easily be a situation where we really struggle because of the effects of the growth. And um, I thoroughly believe that if we need to do a significant tax increase, we should go to the voters. But not to have any wiggle room at all would mean that we would put an override forward, even if it was for a small amount. Um, if it did not pass, we would have to make some very, very possibly painful, difficult cuts and reductions in services that um, you know, bring our quality of services perhaps to a level that the townspeople would rather not have. So there, there is a risk um, at having nothing there at all. I will also add that this year's budget, although it's a 2.5% overall tax impact, the actual um, tax increase is more like five and a half and the vast majority of that, 2.93%, is new growth. $2 million in new growth that has supported that and kept that burden off the tax payers. Um, the new growth projections are actually on a downward trend. Um, two years ago, our new growth brought in $2.8 million. Last year, it was 2.2. This year, it's $2 million. Next year is projected at 1.8, and the following year is projected at 1.7. So the income from the new growth has held up a significant portion of our budget. And so that is something to think about going forward if there is not a cent left on the table um, for what could be some very real needs going forward. And can I ask, Dr. Kavanaugh, would you um, mind also responding to that as the very much the head of one of the biggest service in our town um, if you could respond as well I think so when I think about new growth I think about it in terms of student enrollment uh, this past school year FY19 we anticipated that we would have about 50 additional students in the Hopkinton Public Schools and we ended up with 189 students in the Hopkinton Public Schools. So as I look at that, if we looked at the difference in our expected enrollment and the actual enrollment, it may be just under 140 students. And when I break that down into increments of 20, for every 20 kids, we need about 1.4 full-time faculty. So that was seven times 1.4 teachers, which took me up to about 10 teachers I needed to hire that I did not have in the schools. Um, this current FY20 budget was based on 103 students. Um, at this point in time, 37 of those students are already sitting in front of teachers in our classrooms. They are already here. We have an online registration system, and so we can see how many families have already started to enroll students. And we have um, 32 students who are already you know, starting that process. That gives us wiggle room of about 34 students between now and September 1st or August 28th when we begin school. Uh, my concern is that last year, if we had over 100 students enroll in the summer, uh, we could have many, many more students than we anticipated, and I think when Mrs. Wright uh, talks about those unanticipated needs, those the schools could certainly have one of those unanticipated needs. Thank you. Okay. If I may. Uh, yes. Just want to assure the community that if there was a major unanticipated emergency in town, the community 
over the years has built up its rainy day fund. It stands at approximately just over four million dollars. That represents on its own approximately upon about four and a half to five percent in taxes. So I just want to make sure that people understand that if there was an emergency in town that required additional funding, through its generosity, the community has built up a rainy day fund. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question in the room. Yes, come to the mic. Hi, I'm Ellen Rudder. Um, I guess piggybacking on the rainy day fund question, so hearing that we only have room for 34 more students maybe, does that, would that constitute an emergency if we got 134 more students and we needed 20 more teachers even than expected? When we look at student enrollment, this budget based on the 103 students evenly distributes those 103 students across the grade levels, so it puts about eight students in each grade. Last year, one of the problems that we faced was that we expected 204 kindergarten enrollments and we had 264 kindergarten enrollments. We had about almost 30 additional sixth graders. So when you start to have students, you know, 30 of them in one grade, now you've got to create more teams and hire more full-time faculty. So yes, that could be a problem for us. It really depends on where students land. And when we say 103, if we had nine students at each grade level, you know, certainly you know, we would be able to absorb that, right? But I think that um, that sort of disproportionate kind of enrollment it would be our greatest concern. Uh, last year we were able, so people are probably wondering how did you hire 10 teachers on, on that budget? And one of the things that was sort of advantageous to us, we had, you know, um, you know, power rebates because we had just opened the marathon school. We had a couple of students who had special education outplacements who came back into district. And so we had, you know, additional monies that came to us, I guess, in really fortuitous but unbudgeted ways. We can't count on that again in FY20. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're gonna go to a question uh, which came by email. It's um, sort of detailed. I'm gonna try to paraphrase it. Um, it relates to Articles 41 and 42, uh, the restrictions on residential growth. Um, <clears throat> oh, there it moved. Okay, you're moving it. Um, okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so these are articles, it's a, a citizen's petition, um, and the question is relating to can we get some concrete numbers of how these restrictions are going to impact building in the town. Um, excluding legacy farms, how many residential building permits are currently approved and would all of these units be unaffected by the moratorium? Um, and how many additional building permits do you estimate will be filed in the one year period that this article, or one of these articles uh, pertains to. Um, and can you provide an estimate and of how many of those would fall under the restrictions of the proposed moratorium? Um, so that might be partially a question for Mrs. Kramer. Um, I don't know if the, if, do we have Deb in the room? <laughs> okay. Well, that was going to happen later. Historically, in the last few years, I think we've seen, uh, as far as non-legacy um, building permits, perhaps uh, 20 a year um, in, say, single-family homes elsewhere in the community or other uh, multifamily homes. Um, so I think we can probably expect the same number. Uh, any building permits or special permits that are issued before the town meeting vote are grandfathered and can go ahead and be built, um, as well as um, any um, building on lots that are shown on a definitive subdivision plan 
that is either pending before the board now and ultimately approved or already approved. So those can go ahead. So I think we're talking about uh, uh, people who don't have building permits yet um, and new plans that are going to be coming before the board in the coming year would be subject to the bylaw. Okay, thank you. And for the person who asked that, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to get to every single detail. So feel free to email us afterwards and we can also sort of follow up with more specific details. We can sort of look into it and connect you with the right person with answers. Um, okay, here's a question that came in via Facebook. In meetings earlier in March and April, the Zoning Advisory Committee judged both car washes and self-storage as very low in tax revenue generation, job creation, and jobs fitting with the local population. In fact, car washes often ranked lower than self-storage in their discussion in these and several other categories. Given this, why did the Planning Board vote to support changing zoning bylaws to allow car washes on South Street, but remained against recommending the citizens' petition for self-storage? Based on the ZAC discussion, why support either proposal? Gosh, this is fun. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I, ca I can't actually reconfigure all the thinking and the discussion that went into this. There was certainly discussion um, that self-storage facilities um, were not necessarily the best and most attractive use, and that discussion also happened around car washes. Some of the additional... Um, and I don't think anybody was particularly opposed, but we can't, we have an awful lot of open space up there and we didn't really want, and I don't think the ZAC wanted, I was not there for the ZAC discussions. Um, I don't think that we really wanna see South Street populated in its entirety with a very low income generating or employment generating use. So that's, that's that. Um, when we got to the car wash discussion, um, we were, confronted with the reality that they are allowed in downtown, and so the conversation built, perhaps from what the ZAC had discussed. I, I was not at the ZAC hearings. Um, and it, it, we determined that we would really um, like to ask the town to contemplate whether we want to continue to allow car washes in the downtown district um, or not, and allow them someplace else on South Street provided they are um, using the most um, environmentally friendly mechanisms. So that is actually how the conversation happened at the planning board. We supported Zach's recommendation. Um, well, actually, Zach did not put forward the storage facilities as a citizen's petition. So we did not support that as a planning board. Um, and the car washes did come to us, did come to us from Zach, yes. Um, and uh, we contemplated it, and so it must have been, it must have been approved by Zach members to put it on the warrant. Um, thank you, Elaine's nodding along and helping me out here. Um, and, uh, and so we contemplated it, and we decided that it was um, certainly a use that we could support on South Street in the further conversation that it was probably a use that we wouldn't necessarily want in the downtown business district anymore, um, and we thought it was a fair question to put to the voters. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is for uh, the town moderator. Um, last year we tried ele electronic voting. How do you think it went? That's the whole question? That's the whole question. <laughs> Well, I think it's pretty obvious if you attend a town meeting. Uh, there there uh, were some glitches. Some of the glitches relate, in, in particular, the, the last vote that we attempted through electronic voting. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the vendor ran short of ballots, and, uh, and there was a huge surge of uh, people into the hall at a very late hour, uh, and, and that unanticipated surge uh, and the lack of ballots meant that we really couldn't uh, complete the, uh, the particular article through the electronic voting mechanism. So 
a long way around saying it, it was uh, sort of a, a mediocre showing. I think we're going to give it pause, certainly giving it pause this year because we don't intend to use el electronic means uh, for this town meeting, but it's something that uh, will get consideration over the next year or two. Okay, thank you. So we, we continue to get lots of questions online, but if anybody in the room has a question, just jump up, don't let, we're just gonna keep going. Yeah. Uh, Joe Sridava, 21 Hearthstone. I had a question about the moratorium. Um, does that, how would that affect like tear down, rebuild construction? If there's a home being torn, you know, whoever buys the property wants to tear it down and rebuild another home, I'm assuming that moratorium wouldn't apply, or would it? So we have, uh, Deb is here, you're the one of the people who filed the citizen's petition. Would you like to answer that question? Um, if you could come to the mic so people can hear who are watching online, thanks. Um, I'll look to Amy for, um, what we, what we were hoping to, to do was to begin an analysis of what growth is, is being done in Hopkinton. And so we want to take just preliminary precautions that won't have a huge effect. So that was the reason we struck the three-year moratorium and we went to the one year just to give people a little bit of breathing space to try to um, kind of pull them, pull the town together as, he, as in both the selectmen, with both the selectmen and the planning board to try to come to a solution. Um, to, your, to your answer, um, if it was a complete, I don't think renovations would be affected, but a complete teardown most probably would. But we would have to answer that question. Um, we'll have to research it and get back to you on that. I'd be more than happy to. And one follow-up, you mentioned one of the articles you said it has been struck. Can you yeah. explain Article that? Article 41, the three-year moratorium, we felt um, didn't address the, um, didn't address what we wanted it to. Um, we found both of these articles um, written for other towns. And when we proposed them, we began to look at what the outcomes would be. So we just didn't think that the subdivision garden department and village housing really affected what we wanted to do. Okay. We just want to moderately slow it down just so that there's time for regrouping. Okay, so it's on the warrant. What does that mean at town meeting? It just means that we will stand up and we will say no action and it will be struck from the Okay. Warrant. Okay, can yes. I? Um, <clears throat> I just want to, Muriel Kramer, Planning Board, I just want to make it clear that it's a live article on town meeting. So you'll move um, no action, but it is, it's still something that people need to show up um, and be prepared to support the no action so that it doesn't go forward um, because it, it's not being struck. Being struck is sort of the wrong way to, to say it. And I also just, because we're talking about these two again, they are both citizens petition articles um, and I just want to make it clear that the planning board voted not to support either one of them. Okay. And if I could clarify the clarification. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you're going to come before town meeting and, and ask that the article not be moved. It isn't voted on at that point. It's simply taken off the table unless someone else wants to get up in your place and, and make the motion to consider it. Okay. So it could still be considered if someone else other than those that are arguing that it be removed uh, want to see it discussed on town meeting floor. Yeah, well we felt that it was a, a hot enough um, topic um, that a lot of town members are very concerned with um, the spending for the schools has become astronomical, um, and as is the student populations, which are unpredictable. So this is the reason we brought it forward, and it's Article 42, so. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, this question, it relates to uh, EMC Playground. It says, um, if this is an EMC park, shouldn't they be responsible for this? <laughs> I'm going to ask Jay Gulfi to come up. Jay's the Parks and Rec sure. so Commission Director. My, my recollection is that even though it's EMC Park, 
I think this was privately funded by the Egan family. Am I correct in that? I believe. So it's not really, it wasn't really a corporate partnership. I think it was a personal donation that funded that park, I believe. Okay. Mrs. Kramer? I was Kramer. it was funded by individual donations from the town. It, it, yeah, it was, I mean, so the, a little bit of history here. It, it's, it, that park is 18 years old. The, the um, I don't know exactly how old the, the curb cut and the fields are, but I think the um, playground is 18 years old. Uh, I, I, and that was funded by the town. I think, the, I think uh, the Egan family was, might have been one of the larger donors and they had uh, chosen that as a name and, and I think the Parks and Rec Commission at the time decided to allow that to be the name of the park. Perhaps we could rename it Dell EMC Park. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just to back up for a moment, uh, Mr. Terry, could you explain, although this could be for another person, um, just to explain what are communi community preservation funds how is that money collected? Are these items raising our taxes, or are they part of taxes that have already been collected? CPC funds are, uh, and someone else can absolutely jump in, but uh, <laughs> CPC funds are, are, are collected uh, in the past from, from the town. It's, it's a, a, a one or two percent addition to the tax bill that gets put into this fund. Um, it's used for, for purposes like recreation, open space, historical. Uh, someone else can jump in and, and, uh, and add up the other uses. But um, CPC has uh, a few million dollars uh, that it has in the fund to allocate. I don't know what the exact dollar amount is now that's being allocated. We add to it every year. We get uh, six or $700,000 additional money each year goes into it based on the tax levy, and there is a subsidy from the state that, that adds on top of that. I think that was hmm, I don't, another 110 to $150,000 this year, okay. but it varies from year to year. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and just to follow on for the playground renovations, could you explain the $260,000? Um, what would that be covering of the playground? So. Jay Golf is going to come up because he has worked with a couple of different vendors on this and, uh, and, and has developed the plans. So based on feedback over the last probably two or three years from several different um, groups in town, most specifically the Moms Group, the Hopkinton Moms Group, we kind of came to the determination that the playground needed a, at a minimum a facelift and, and more likely just sort of a start over. So we... Um, we contacted several companies that specialize in this and started working with one on, on a research sort of project and came up with a number of between two hundred dollars and two hundred and $275,000 um, to do what it is we feel we need to do to the park, which is replace the equipment and more importantly, replace the ground surface, which the, several of, a lot of the moms in town felt were dangerous and inappropriate and, and just sort of out of date. So short answer is we came up with that number through working with a, uh, a playground company. So when the time comes, assuming this is approved, we will put that project out to bid and see which playground company can do the best job for us. And what's the timeline on the project if it is approved? So my understanding is once it's approved, we can start uh, spending that money July 1st of 2018, 2019. And do you have like a projected completion time? I hate to commit to that. <laughs> um, we'd like to complete it this fall though. Okay. That's when we'd like to have it completed by. Okay. Um, oh, we might have another question for you. This one, Facebook? Yeah. Facebook, okay. No, that's not. Uh, we're wondering if you're uh. considering inclusive playground equipment. So, as we've come to learn in this research, basically all playground equipment um, is inclusive now. Um, it's become a priority among playground users, parents, and so those companies that build playgrounds are now, are now building that into their, into their business model. 
So yes, we, we intend on our equipment being inclusive to all children, um, regardless of um, uh, disabilities, physical or intellectual. That's part of the plan. And so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, we're gonna move to a different topic. Um, uh, yes, quick follow up. Actually, I had a separate question, if that's okay. Um, that's okay. So, sorry. One of the best parts of living in this town, especially where I live over by the nursery, is your parents get off the highway and they have to drive through town to come see you. So they've driven through a little bit of Norman Rockwell on the way, which is great, because my house is in Norman Rockwell, but they get it on the way over. My father's been killing me about something for the past six months when he comes to visit. Why do you live in such a nice town that can't keep any businesses open on its main street? So. I'm going to ask a question as someone who's concerned about non-residential growth in the town. I think you've made it abundantly clear that residential growth in the town is absolutely happening. That's great. As someone who's concerned about non-residential growth in the town, what is the initiative that you're presenting or that you're recommending I should be interested in and knowledgeable about for the town meeting? What can I support that's going to further my interest? Those don't seem to have been discussed tonight. So if we... If we re that's not relating to a specific, well, if we relate that to specific articles in the town meeting, because really that's what we're talking about tonight is the articles that are coming to town meeting. Um, are there any zoning articles or um, that we would like to highlight? So Ms. Wright and Ms. Kramer both look like they have a response. Well, I, I, I just want to say, say that um, what we've been hearing consistently from the business community is the problem right now with lack of parking in the downtown, um, and our town hall has lack of parking, so there are a couple articles that are on both on the warrant and also on the ballot questions to make some accommodations for both the town hall parking and municipal parking. Um, and I think that has been a problem for existing businesses and um, realistically an impediment for additional businesses coming in. So I think that's probably one of the strongest contributions we can make to keeping a, a, a vital, uh, strong business environment would be to provide for some parking. Yeah, so thanks for the question, and I think it's a really important one. And the one, the, the articles that jump into my head um, are the growth moratorium articles that we just talked about. And while the planning board did not support those articles going forward, the discussion that they enable, empower, and inspire um, is an important discussion to have, and we certainly do support that. And we're really trying to sort of gear up and construct um, a, a strategic discussion that involves all stakeholders and all pressure points. Um, and that would be a key point, Matt, that you bring up, um, is, is how to vitalize or revitalize downtown. And one thing that I've heard, and I'm starting to, to hear some energy around is that um, with a town that's growing the way it is, with a town that has prioritized the downtown for a very long time, and a lot of people have um, done a lot of work and, and made strides, but we aren't where we want to be, um, it simply might be the time, um, and it's not an article on town meeting, but it would hopefully be part of that bigger discussion. Um, it, it's, it, it might be time to, to hire somebody who really, um, who really targets and drives uh, the, not only the downtown but also South Street. That's another that's another spot that's underutilized and has been underutilized um, as long as I've lived here, um, including since the improvements have gone in up there. Um, so somebody who pro is a professional economic development director for the town of Hopkinton is um, is certainly an idea that I hope we talk about in the coming year as part of that whole growth discussion um, and uh, you know town priority and development and going forward discussion. Hi, I actually wanted to go back to the parking question, the article on parking, I think it was 51. So there's an article coming before us on um, to acquire parcels of land without telling us where the parcels of land are, what they are. Um, can they, you expand on what exactly what parcels these are? And if everybody could just hold the mic right up because we've gotten some feedback from online viewers that it's hard to hear. 
for the town hall parking, we are discussing and negotiating to acquire a parcel right next to town hall <coughs> off Walcott Street. The That's one behind the Bill's Pizza? No. Okay. On Walcott Street, 6 Walcott Street. So and then... Shouldn't the article include where the parcel is and how much it'll cost us? Sorry, to the, clarify, this yes. is EHOP's summary. This is oh, not okay. the wording of the article, and the article does say six Walcott. Oh, okay. Thank Sorry. you. The, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, okay, question from Facebook. Article 46 and the Claflin House. Can we get some context on the history of the house, and has an independent assessment been done to indicate that it is no longer viable as a commercial building? Um, Mike Rowan, I'm chairman of the Historical Commission, and this article is jointly sponsored by the Historical District Commission in the Historical Commission. So the reason we got involved is a demolition application was submitted on this property. In the Historical Commission, has the governance over any property that's more than 75 years old to determine if A, the property is historically significant, and if so, is it preferably preserved? Well, the commission voted unanimously that it was both historically significant and preferably preserved. It's the fourth oldest structure in town. We just lost the toll house that was on East Main Street, a timber frame mortise and tenon constructed building that looked awful from the outside, but if you saw the bones of the building, it was awesome. This structure, the question on the table is, has anyone determined whether this has any commercial viability? I cannot do that because I have not been permitted to go into the building. I've been refused access. A colleague of ours has been in the building and the developer has allowed a potential mover to come in and assess the building without photographs. But we don't believe we'll be able to do that because anyone who wants to, is professionally trained to either move or reconstruct the building requires a fee for their services and we do not have the funds to pay for that service. So the historical commission, and I believe I can speak for the historic district, we cannot determine whether the structure is viable for commercial use. But that's exactly why there's two articles on the ballot. One is to make this a local historic district so we can enforce the potential of surveying the property internally and helping the town make that determination. And two, a demo delay of 18 months to do the same thing. So we have two articles on the ballot. Both have a similar intention. Did I answer the question? Uh, yes, I think you did. Okay. Um, really, it was, does, does the building no longer, is it no longer viable as a commercial building? But you said you don't have the answer because you're not able to go in and assess. But I'll let people look at the building, look at the structure, look at how it's been maintained, and, and judge it for themselves. Okay. A uh, question from the room. Just a question relating to this. Um, if the home is designated as a historical district or local. You got it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Does that protect it from, I'm assuming this developer owns it, wants to do something with it. If he wants to, if he resells it, is, does this protect it against other types of housing, notably 40B, which I understand is very open? Uh, I, I appreciate the question. Um, a local historic district provides governance over the structures in that district in perpetuity. So the historic district is in, in, it has the governance to oversee that structure within reason. There are limits to what they can impose on the structure, but the intent of a local historic district, and I live in one. I live in town. I live in a historic district, and I love it. I believe it's in my best interest to be in a historic district because it protects not only the character of my house, but the neighborhood. And that's what this is about. This is about 
the neighborhood. This is about the context. This is about the fourth oldest house structure in downtown Hopkinton. In the integrity that that structure provides, the legacy that provides in, in the character of the neighborhood. So, uh, but there are limits to what a historic district can do. But regarding your specific question, um, it, there is no oversight. There's, uh, there's no other legislation that could superimpose um, conditions on the property that would allow it to be demolished without the approval of the historic district. As far as I know, I'm not a lawyer, but it's, that's, that's my understanding. Okay. Is that clear or no? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, was it clear? I'm sorry I answered that, but really it was your question. Okay, um, <clears throat> here's a question that came in on Facebook. It relates to articles 44 and 45, changing Board of Selectmen to Select Board, which is a citizen's petition. Um, over one third of towns have made this inclusive name change. We refer to fire and police as officers, not by gender. And this year, Massachusetts State Legislative Committee chairs are simply now referred to as chair of a committee. Can you confirm that this change costs the town nothing? It seems Hopkinton is already behind this inclusive language change. Any thoughts on this? Uh, so, hi, I'm Amy Groves and I wrote the uh, citizen's petition. I'm the citizen. Um, and I, I heard a question about does it cost anything and the answer is no, this should not cost anything. Um, I'm a taxpayer so if anybody in town government proposes to spend any money on this, I'd like to know why. <laughs> um, the reason it doesn't cost anything is because we are starting now and we're starting with the bylaws as opposed to jumping into, say, a special charter review or a ballot question or something like that. So if we start with the bylaws, if that's approved um, at town meeting, then we have a considerable amount of time, years in fact, before we have regular charter review, before that even starts. And what that means is that everybody has lots and lots of time to get used to the idea and to adjust any documents that need to be adjusted. For instance, the town website can be adjusted just as part of regular website maintenance, but we're not on a terrible pressing schedule uh, because the charter still has the old language. Um, and then when regular charter review comes up, everybody will be used to the idea, the frog will be boiled, and um, this will not add to the complexity and difficulty and challenge of charter review, which is always hard. Um, we don't want to add to that. It's something that people will pretty much be used to by then. So that's why we're starting now, and that's why we're starting with the, um, this particular process with the, um, the zoning and general bylaws as opposed to some other document. Thank you. Um, any comment or confirmation of the no cost um, from the panel? I just figured because it was a citizen's petition, it would be helpful to get uh, confirmation from a town official. Um, if we're changing the zoning bylaw and the general bylaws, we have to print them, don't we? I'm sorry, Mr. Kamal, you said we have to what them? We have to make the changes in the documents and thus print them to make them available for the public. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, putting them online would, would be putting them online. So, you know, there, there will be other bylaws changes, presumably from, the, um, from town meeting anyway, so you're going to have to print them. So... Okay. And I also I did um, I did consult with um, I actually went to town hall to discuss you know how this change could be made, and this was actually the way that was suggested to me. Um, spoke to the town clerk, and I, I'm not quite positive, so don't quote me, but I believe that town council was consulted about it as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to go to the top. Okay. Uh, this question relates to Article 17C, Fire Station Feasibility Study. Can you provide some background about this and explain the goal? 
in fact, if I may, as the fire chief is walking up to the mic, to be clear, this is a public safety facilities feasibility study. Maybe, maybe we can get further clarification on that as well so we all understand what that means. Sure, so public safety would be police, fire, dispatching, and emergency management. So just a broad umbrella, pretty much everything I work with is emergency management director on a daily basis. Um, so a few years ago, we, with the uh, start of the heavy growth, um, several times we had questions in meetings about whether we would need a, a potential second fire station or a response zone in the town. Uh, part of our assessment um, is I used a, uh, uh, a lecture I um, met in a conference that does that and reviews towns to just to give us a quick snapshot to see whether the need was there. We did some reviews of response areas, kind of looked at what we're providing today and how much uh, additional growth and additional response requirements we had, and then I asked about emergency management, um, the police department, and uh, some of the examples we had were like um, our emergency at town hall when we uh, realized the impact of when we lose a single facility and trying to uh, adjust to that. We have a, one police station and one fire station right now. Uh, so co some communities that were impacted like um, Concord had a fire on their fire station and I, 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 I talked to them extensively and they realized the impact was like what we had at town hall and to not have some form of redundancy so those are all questions we have and we're still searching for the answer. This is the, uh, we have a small snippet that we did a report on that I reviewed with Mr. Kamalo, but we need to make this next step of, um, the, the number is what we're talking about right now. We have a $75,000 number which was to look just at the fire department and that number will probably have to increase in this, but um, to study the whole town and the impact to the town. Um, it's about $130,000, $140,000 assessment that I understand right now. And so one follow-up. So the item that we're voting on is $75,000, which you just said is going to cover a fire station feasibility study, which is not the public safety, p the bigger picture part. So a lot of what we're talking about has occurred in the last month. I'm hoping Mr. Kamala was going to look at me and say we might have an adjustment there that, that covers the broader sense. And it all depends on how much you want to look at in this step of the process. So if we want to really get to the point where we're um, looking at the functions inside of police, fire, dispatch, emergency management, begin to look at some, uh, assess the options, and, and then get to the point where we actually look at sites, which, which is a very important to do early on, to try to locate the uh, correct site early in the process. So for all of that to occur, that um, kind of on the move, we're realizing that number may go up a little bit, so. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, does this budget include increased library hours? And if so, when? Here comes the director of the library. Good evening. I'm excited. I didn't expect to actually get to talk tonight. Um, this budget carries over funds for increased library hours, which were appropriated actually in the FY19 budget. Uh, we've been making the logistics of that work, and we're very close to having news. I can't officially say anything quite yet, but hopefully very soon. We did um, immediately last year add summer Saturdays to our schedule with uh, a portion of that funding, uh, which was very well received and we will continue doing that going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we have a question from our town clerk. I, I actually just wanted to make a quick comment based on the, uh, the previous mention of the articles relating to the select board question. Um, as a, a town employee that would be implementing a lot of the, the changes to the bylaws themselves. Uh, really the only cost association, like we, I had talked with Amy about it, like she said, uh, when she was first looking into it, charter review and changing is extremely costly, as many of us know, and takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, and upon looking into it, the biggest real cost uh, that's immediate would just be the time it takes to go through and make every single change to it. So it's mostly a time change. I already print the bylaws to be available annually. 
Uh, so they're available to the public at a uh, cost of net zero to the town. And uh, so there's no additional cost there. All the other changes <laughs> seemingly would be relating to, um, to letterhead and things like that, again, could be done after the after exhausting the stuff that is already already there. But otherwise, as, that's why I just wanted to make clear the only real cost is time and effort that goes into it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about Article 23. Um, can you give a high-level overview of the five-year sidewalk plan, the cost, and the location of the new sidewalks? Um, I wonder if John Westerling, the director of the DPW, might want to come up and answer that. Absolutely. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, the new sidewalk sections that were voted on by the Board of Selectmen include two, and there is one on Wood Street for the cost of $100,000, which will extend from the terminus of the sidewalk in front of the church, uh, and will go past the DPW up to Proctor Street. And the other sidewalk is $960,000, and that will extend the sidewalk that currently ends near Lumber Street across to uh, just beyond Price Chopper, along West Main Street. Okay. So that's where Starbucks and 110 Grill is, all the way past like the Cumberland Farms, under 495, past South Street and connecting in Price Chopper and then going down to Downey. Correct. Is that right? Great, so it connects that whole area to Price Chopper, it connects the businesses together so that people can walk back and forth. Correct. Or bike, yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we have, uh, I'm gonna go uh, to a question in the schools and then um, we'll come back. So, let's see. There is a request for funds for the construction of a bus parking lot um, behind the high school for $300,000. Um, this will supplement funds approved last year. Uh, why are we voting on more money now? And when will construction begin and end? Um, so yes, this, the cost for the parking lot, um, the original estimate we put together for the last town meeting was before we had gone through any of the permitting process and also going out for our original bids, um, which happened last summer. In going through all of the permitting process, there were more stormwater um, conditions that we needed to meet which raised the elevation of the parking lot. There was additional lighting, additional um, landscaping. And so all those costs added on increased the cost of the parking lot. Um, so, and we have actually put this out to bid already in the fall. So we do have a bid that with an intent to award that will be for just a little shy of that uh, 700,000. So these are based on very real costs um, for the design and, and engineering that was put together based on all the, the permitting and, and demands that we needed to meet for this parking lot. So construction would be this summer. Um, we would have that contractor in as soon as possible once school closed. Just one follow-up question. If that article doesn't pass, what is the impact? What's the result? So the, the way we have our drop-off and um, dismissal procedures right now in front of the high school, there's several traffic conflicts, um, you know, between parent um, traffic that is coming to pick up, students that are walking to their own vehicles, the buses that are also loading, unloading, um, so when you look at traffic studies and in, in design and how to do um, to, to design a campus, they always look to separate all those different modes of transportation. So right now we have every mode of transportation all in the same location. So that's caused a, a real concern. Um, so if we are unable to pass the parking lot, it would continue to operate as it is now. Um, we don't really have other options. We looked at other options of where we could have the students dismissed and, 
and line up buses um, basically all around the campus. We looked at all different options. And this was really the safest alternative to keep them um, from not obstructing emergency access, uh, both all around the, the middle school and the high school, and also to keep that out of the uh, traffic pickup, both at the middle school and also in front of the high school. Thank you. While we're on the topic of schools, um, there was a question relating to the $50,000 item for the um, school capacity study. Can you sort of elaborate on what that is about? Sure, uh, given our increased enrollment, uh, we realized that we needed to take a look at our physical plants as well. So for example, this high school on a daily basis is um, at capacity somewhere between about 87% and 95% given each class period, meaning that that's how full our classrooms are you know, during the day. Um, we have submitted to the Mass School Building Authority a statement of interest. Hopefully we will be invited into the pipeline for the Elmwood School, and that project is a renovation and um, sort of new construction. So what we would like for our capacity study to do is to just take a look at our community, look at the trends in growth, housing projections, um, employment projections, land use projections, and think you know, sort of hard about uh, the neighborhoods and the demography and you know, who is uh, moving out of houses and who's moving into houses, and then really think about what our buildings can sustain. Um, if our enrollment continues to grow the way that it does, I think that we are going to uh, need to put nor more classrooms on this building. Um, as you may or may not know, when we were building this, the high school 20 years ago, uh, there are two wings out in the back. During construction, six additional classrooms were constructed on one wing. They did not construct the six additional classrooms on the other. If you're standing behind the building and you look at it, you'll notice that one of the wings is shorter than the other. Uh, there are drawings that would give us six additional classrooms back there. We are unaware at this point in time how much each one of those classrooms would cost us. So this, the capacity study will help us to know how many kids we can expect and what our physical plants can sustain. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> are all the schools at capacity? I don't know if you answered that in your question. This, I'm just looking down, that came in. Uh, the Marathon School is fine right now. Uh, if you, the Hopkins School has a little bit of wiggle room, but as we start to move kids into additional classrooms that are now occupied, uh, by something else. Those might be interior classrooms that would have window spaces out to hallways, but they wouldn't have window spaces to the exterior of the building. And Mrs. Rothamick can probably help me with this, but I believe that when that building was designed, there are places out back where you could put temporary classrooms. Um, and those you know, could range, obviously, in, in price um, fairly significantly. Uh, the middle school has a little bit of wiggle room as well. There's um, that the meeting room in uh, the very front of that that building, you know, just off uh, the principal's area, that is empty. And we also have a tech program in there now that's going to be moving out for next year. So that will free up a little bit of space. Uh, but we, I think, all of our schools are going to need to really have that capacity study done to decide where we're going to put children. Okay, thank you. Um, we don't want to leave out the dogs, so we have a question about the dog park. <laughs> um, there is a request for $150,000 for a dog park. Last year, the dog park request failed. How is this one different? Uh, this one's different because um, we, we're looking at a new location for this one, and the Parks and Rec Commission looked at several locations. We re-looked at the Hughes property. Uh, we included a couple other properties and, and the plan is to move forward with uh, uh, some land that's centrally located in the Fruit Street parcel. Uh, so we don't feel like th there'd be uh, much concern for abutters, uh, but this request is the start of the process. We would get the funding. We would still need to get permitting. We would need to do planning and construction 
and in, in order to complete this. This is uh, a funding request. It is not a final approval. Um, and I'll also add that this $150,000 is contingent upon us getting a $250,000 uh, $250,000 in funding from the Stanton Foundation. They had uh, pledged that support a couple of years ago on the other on the other program on the other uh, dog park that we proposed, um, and they said it's fairly common for towns to move or need to relocate uh, a, a plan and and take a little bit of time. So they're they're patient and looking forward to our uh, getting these funds and and. Um, moving forward with our application to them and with the project. Okay, thank you. Question? I've been busy up here tonight. People have been sending me questions too. So um, this one's on Article 52. Um, it's about easements for Main Street Corridor Project authorization. Um, is it true that um, over 90 um, property owners got certified letters this week asking them to donate their property versus getting any compensation? to give up, give up their property rights for easements? Yes, it is true that letters were sent out to property owners abutting Main Street. Um, it is not true that we are asking people to give up the option to sell their property if they need to. Just to be clear, last year at annual town meeting, Selectmen received authorization to proceed with acquiring these easements. Right, so that would the be, main, oops, sorry. Would that be eminent domain without giving any compensation? Which is what no. the, the letter that I was just showed said to donate. No. Again, the letter lists the different options available. Because part of the funding for the Main Street project is coming through federal funds. We are required to allow everybody to state whether they want to donate or they want to be paid for the easements. I just want to mention um, that what are being requested are easements, which is not uh, a loss of ownership. I understood that there were perhaps as many as 200 property owners that are somewhere along the Main Street Corridor project. Some are being asked to give a permanent easement, which might be for a permanent piece of infrastructure like a, a mast arm or a lamp post that has to go there, um, in which case they still maintain the ownership. It is just the easement, which is the allowance of this item to be put on your property or access to your property that is permanent, but they don't give up their property. It's not like the land is being taken. Many of these, um, probably the majority, are temporary easements. And temporary easements are very, very common in municipal projects where there needs to be access granted to the property. It could be, in this case, where we're doing undergrounding. For every property along the line, they're going to have to go onto the property to bring that electrical service off the pole, there won't be any wires anymore. It's all going to go under. You're going to have to bring it in from the property underground to connect to the undergrounding. So that's going to require temporary access to the property to do that work. There is also blending, whether it's where a driveway cut comes in or a sidewalk or there's lawn area that eventually you want to blend the new <coughs> in with the old. And so there needs to be temporary access on the property to get this whole project to work together. But they are not getting up their property. They're being asked to grant easement, which is access. Um, this is a very common thing in municipal projects. Payment for that easement is one method, but very often it's donated. Um, if the town has to pay, and that is what the article will be asking to provide some funding for, um, the more property owners that are not willing to simply grant this access but demand a fee, this is all going to be borne by the taxpayers. Those easements are not part of the cost of the federal funds. They will be borne by the residents of Hopkinton. So we are indeed hoping that people will be willing to grant that access, more often than not temporary, to keep the cost down for everybody. 
Um, I just want to give one example um, in my own experience. When the uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery, when we put in drainage to deal with the high groundwater and allow all the land to be used, at the end the water needed to be discharged over an area and into a waterway that did not belong to the town. It belonged to Al and Marge Wright. Um, he was the owner at the time of Lumbertown, which is now Hoppington Lumber. And the town asked for, in this case, permanent easement to discharge the water from the town cemetery into his land area. And Al was more than happy to help the town because this was a municipal purpose that needed to go forward. And he was more than willing to grant that, in this case, permanent easement as a donation, as no charge to the town to accept the water into his, into his stream through his property. So this is a very common thing that's done for municipal projects. And we are hoping that more often than not, the donors, they will donate it to keep the cost down for the overall community to make the Main Street project go forward. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the clock, and we still have time for some more questions, but I, I want to make sure that we give a moment. If We've had um, two people come up with citizens' petitions and had an opportunity to explain their petitions. And I don't know if there's anybody else in the room. I know there's a citizens' petition for connecting Colella Farm Road to Town Sewer. There's a citizen's petition to allow um, self-storage on South Street. Um, there may be others. Just double checking. No, okay. Uh, I wanted to give those citizens an opportunity to explain why they filed their petition. Uh, okay, so let's see. <clears throat> Anything? Uh, okay, this actually, where is that in here? Do you have that up? There's a petition, there's an article, Article 50, Chamberlain Street Curve. This would remove 1,400 square feet of land from conservation restriction that was previously given to the town to Hopkinton Area Land Trust. What is the purpose and who benefits from this? So the purpose of this article is to um, address an issue of public safety that came up when the planning board was reviewing uh, a subdivision plan that extends uh, Chamberlain Street. So Chamberlain Street right now, um, on the ground, it, it dead ends and makes a hard turn to the right. And that's a public way that the town accepted many years ago. Uh, when the street uh, was accepted, uh, excuse me, extended, um, as is under construction right now, um, the public safety input at the public hearings was that the fire trucks, in particular, are going to have difficulty making that turn. So uh, a number of options were discussed, and one of them is um, uh, changing that curve, either expanding it outward or on the inside curve. And uh, I spoke with the Hopkinton Area Land Trust, who was interested in um, an exchange of uh, land where the town might um, use a small 1,400 square foot section at the inside of the curve in return for um, adding an additional 5.7 acres to the conservation restriction of the Center Trail and the Wells L Trail. So the article proposes to petition the legislature to um, allow this um, to occur. Um, and either way, um, the road will be extended, um, but this would assist um, the fire trucks in making that turn. And the land was donated, or the conservation restriction was donated to the land trust by the town. It's the high school uh, conservation restriction, so it's on town property, and the town uh, did donate that conservation restriction to the land trust. Thank you. We have somebody at the yeah. mic. Hi, Kathy Hudson. I have a question. You mentioned, the superintendent mentioned that potentially the school could add six more classrooms out the back, but would that affect where the buses are potentially going to be parked? Uh, actually, it would not. It would be um, stacked, so you would have two, two, and two, so it would be three floors, so it does not go out into the um, emergency access driveway would be the first 
area, so it does not even go past that emergency driveway into where the buses would be, so it would not have an impact. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, I'm actually going to go to one other question here. It's relating to the solar farms. Um, Article 40, uh, year-round screening around solar farms. Can you describe this um, sort of in more detail, and what is the goal? So, yeah, thank you. Um, so we have seen a number of solar farm uh, special permit applications come before us on the planning board. Um, we recently approved one. Um, on Lumber Street, which backs up to um, Teresa Road um, and the, the, the Charles Gate. Um, recognizing that solar farms are permittable um, in residential zones and that that often means that they are plunked, you know, next to um, residential properties. Um, and seeing the ways that that particular solar farm has affected the neighboring apartments from a viewscape standpoint. Um, the planning board and the ZAC thought that it was important to look at ways that we could um, lessen the visual impact if possible. So for example, just using the Lumber Street solar farm and, and the neighboring residences, um, they did not require any um, waivers on their setbacks. They met all the setbacks, met or exceeded the setbacks. And when we all walked around the property, um, we thought we had done a great job and we had understood that the existing uh, property in between would screen the residences appropriately. And we recognized that it really just isn't so. So we would like to have um, have it in the bylaws that solar farms that are abutting residences in particular um, can be expected and asked to create 20, you know, year round, not dependent on the season, um, adequate screening from neighboring residential properties. So it's, it's the first step in trying to address, um, you know, some of the impacts that we are seeing from solar installations that are currently allowed in all residential districts. Um. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I have a couple of just wrap-up questions, but if there's anybody else in the room that would like to ask a question, now's a good, now's your chance. Okay. Um, I wanted to just, yes, um, say, is there anything that we haven't touched on tonight that you think is important for residents, citizens to know before they go to town meeting? Any particular article or issue that anybody wants to comment on? It's been pretty exhaustive, so that's good. <laughs> okay, um, very good. So uh, I'm gonna just let everybody know that we have a lot of materials on ehop.org, so we've covered a lot of ground tonight. There are more articles that we didn't, we didn't touch on everything. Um, so if you go to our website, you'll find the warrant, the appropriations committee report, the annual report. Um, we have a little slideshow that's very basic for people who haven't been to town meeting. It sort of steps you, the pro through, you through the process of what to expect. Um, so please look to ehop as a resource. Um, and I just want to thank everyone again for coming, and especially to our panel um, for being here and answering all our questions. If it wasn't for all of you, this forum wouldn't be happening, so thank you so much. Um, we also want to just give a final thank you to the Board of Selectmen for granting us a marathon bib number, um, which, again, really has a wonderful impact on the work that we do. Um, and I think that... Oh, this is a good reminder. So when you go to town meeting on May 6, 7 p.m. in the middle school auditorium, uh, look for EHOP. We are going to have a welcome table. We started this at special town meeting. We have bottles of water. We're there to answer questions, especially for people who haven't been to town meeting before. It's just a friendly face to come over and say hello. Um, and I think that...
covers it. So thank you. Uh, as soon as HCAM wraps up, there's going to be an archive on YouTube so people can come back and refer to all of the material that we just covered. Thank you so much, and good night.